Good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, contact session of uh, English Second Language Teaching um, for the Diploma in Pre and Junior Primary Education. Um, the, this, this presentation is going to take you through some important aspects of your course, or important topics of your course, rather. Uh, it's also very important to note that while you are be going through these notes, it's important to note the fact that this is a PowerPoint presentation and it only contains main points of the topics discussed. So elaborations, explanations, you need to work with your study guide when you use this uh, presentation as a guide. Um, I, you know, have uh, um, looked at certain uh, aspects of your course, and um, yeah, you, 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 I will take you through what I have prepared. Uh, the first uh, item that I looked at is uh, semantics and pragmatics. Um, as you all know by now, all these uh, two concepts of uh, grammar or of language um, concern themselves with meaning, right? So if we talk about semantics, we talk about the study of meaning, how meaning is constructed, interpreted, clarified, obscured, illustrated, simplified, and negotiated. So what we are talking about here is that we are looking at what words mean without, before, when they are not put in context. For example, if you come across the word do, then you've got to, you know, take the meaning of the word do uh, from, you know, from the way it's written, right? But uh, um, if somebody says, for example, uh, when one door is closed, many more are open, uh, they may not necessarily mean the physical door that you we all know of as the meaning of the word door. So given in, used in a different context or different, used in different context, the word door may mean different things. And that is what pragmatics is about. Uh, it's how people use language within a context in real life situations. So here we are talking about, um, about utterances, uh, the way things are said. If somebody says a word, when they are angry, we know that they don't like it. But if they say it smilingly, we know that they appreciate you know, what has happened. So the words attached to the situation um, that it is used will also determine the meaning of that word. Uh, so that is what, how semantics and pragmatics are different in a way. Um, then we are also going to look at cognitive domain uh, and how cognitive dom domain may assist in language acquisition. Um, we all know that cognitive domain is actually has to do with the mind, with the process, the, mind, the, uh, the, the, the process that happens in our minds. Cognitive domain plays a role in language development in children in the following ways. Um, we know that without thoughts, we cannot actually you know, uh, uh, say something. We think about things, then we can speak uh, those things or we can utter them. Um, <clears throat> we also uh, 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 develop language by maybe listening to others. So if we cannot be attentive, uh, then obviously we cannot, you know, uh, understand language. Um, also from remembering events, if we can remember events, then we can, you know, conceptualize them in words. Uh, understand the environment, most of the things that we speak about are things surrounding us. So it's very important that we, if we understand our environment so that we can you know, put that into words to discuss about our environment, our immediate family members, uh, our learners, our school environment and so on. So um, cognitive domain is also very important for language domain uh, acquisition because that is where a planning, prediction, regulation, evaluation of any given situation happens. So these help in the development of language as well. So we, we cannot, uh, if, 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 if the mind is not there, we cannot talk about you know, learning a language. 
Um, then we have physical development domain of childhood development. What does this entail? What do we mean by physical development domain? Uh, physical do development domain entails the development of the physical skills, being able to move our bodies, all right? Gestures and so on, and being able to walk from one place to another. Uh, these are purposeful movements because we decide we are going to make the movements and we make them for certain purposes. Uh, we learn physical characteristics of the self and the environment. Um, it helps children to develop cross motor skills, uh, being able to move your arms, swinging them, you know, moving your body and so on, and also fine motor skills and hand-to-eye coordination. So, for example, in writing, if a child has to learn to write, they need to move their arm, they need to grab a pencil, uh, they need to follow with the eye where they are writing. So these are all physical skills that are involved. Uh, therefore, it is important that a child is physically developed in order for them to learn or uh, to develop as a whole in school as well. Uh, balance and uh, kinesthetic sense, it depends on the child's growth. If, if a child is not, does not grow physically, then obviously there is going to be some, you know, it's going to bring problems in their learning. Um, so what causes, uh, what may cause, uh, um, you, know, you know, lack of growth in a child, maybe poor nutrition. Uh, we hear in most of our schools, there are school feeding programs where children cannot have their own food. Um, so what is the purpose of that is to, you know, to, to, to make sure that there is enough nutrition for the children to grow. And when they grow, they can learn or when they grow physically, they can actually do other activities in school. Uh, frequent illness can jeopardize child's physical development. So if they are constantly ill, uh, they may not grow well and that affects their learning also in school. So what we are saying here is that we need to understand physical development. We need to take care of our physical needs in order for us to be able to learn. Uh, behaviorist perspective of language development. Um, what does this, this mean? Um, we have the word behavior, um, and what it means is that infants learn language from human role models. Um, if you have uh, a child, you know, in a family, they will take you, the, you know, the, 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 the grown-ups or the adults as their role models in terms of language. So they imitate what you actually voice out. And uh, um, in this view, or in this perspective, it is believed that um, language learning is actually uh, <clears throat> uh, aided by the process which involves imitation, where the child imitates what they hear from the adults, uh, and that when they imitate, they are rewarded, and because they are rewarded, they continue practicing. What do we mean by reward? Uh, what we mean by reward in this sense is affection that is shown. For example, if your toddler you know, utters a word, what do you do? You, you become happy and you praise them. You clap your hands at them. That shows that you appreciate it and they also want to continue doing that because they are happy because you are happy for them. Um, human role models provide rewards and stimuli, so us as adults are the ones that provide rewards and also we provide stimuli. Stimuli is uh, what encourages the children to, you know, to, 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 to utter those words that they copy from the adults. Children praise and give an affection for attempting a language pattern. So if they attempt, you praise them, you give them affection, then they also continue. Praise and affection here serves as reward. So this is how this perspective views language development in children. Um, but there are criticisms of the behavioralist perspective of language development. Some people say, but if uh, uh, children can learn a language only from listening or and imitating adults, and also they are encouraged to continue imitating adults by being praised and rewarded. Uh, what about situations where they are 
parents don't even care about the children who are absent. So they don't offer this kind of reward. But still, there is language development. So we cannot say that language develops only in a situation where there is reward uh, and there are role models. Um, and also, if there is no reward, then if language was only learned through this way, then attempts may stop due to absence of rewards. Children that are not rewarded may stop learning a language. Um, there are also children that come up with newer forms that are not modeled by others. For example, you've got a child uh, who comes up with an utterance that you know the adults around him or her do not use. So where does this come from? If we say that language can only be learned through copying, uh, what they hear from the role models and also there is there seems to be a uniform acquisition of language by humans so you would find children from different backgrounds or different places learning having the same language acquisition patterns so how do you explain these if you believe that they have to copy from somebody um, then we have the interactionist perspective of language development uh, probably from the word interaction. Uh, language acquisition is both biological and social. According to this perspective, language acquisition is both biological and social. Um, that means it is something within the person and also it is nurtured by interaction with others. Influenced by desire to communicate, desire to communicate, I think uh, um, even when an infant is born, they communicate by crying, isn't it? So as they grow, they also want, because they see somebody, everybody communicating within their surrounding, they also want to communicate. Uh, children born with a powerful brain. So in this case, we also believe that it's biological. The power, they, they, they've got a powerful brain, and this brain matures slowly and predisposes them to acquire new understanding. So as they grow, they will be understanding language. Uh, then we have characteristics of young learners and ways to accommodate them. Um, when learners learn, they all have different, they, they have different difficulties to cope with the learning uh, content or the learning environment. So as teachers, we need to understand the different common characteristics that we may come across and find ways to solve those. The first one that we're going to look at is the di difficulty to concentrate. Difficult to concentrate. There are those children that cannot just concentrate. They are up and down, they are busy, they are hyper and so on. So how do you deal with that? Because if you slow the pace in class, they get bored, you know, and if they get bored, then they become disruptive. Now, you can deal with those by giving a variety of activities in one lesson. Uh, combine active activities such as singing and perhaps dancing, uh, you know, acting and so on, so that if they cannot concentrate, they will be attracted by uh, uh, that particular activity. So if you only have one activity for the whole period, they may not be able to you know, uh, follow you through. But if you have different activities that you combine in your lesson, that will keep their attention uh, um, or will get them concentrated. There are those that are very active, curious, unself-conscious, and willing. All right, they 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 want to do something. They are curious. They are very active in class. Uh, how do you deal with those ones? Um, introduce things like drama, singing, teach them by games. Uh, use attractive visual aids such as pictures. Uh, use self-discovery activities like puzzles and games. So these will help you to get these ones to do something. They are product, very productive, but they want to do something. They cannot just sit without doing something. Um, there are those that learn quickly but forget quickly. Um, all you need to do is to give constant revision in class. Use the new, if you've taught a new structure, for example, you've taught uh, uh, regular verbs, keep using those in your lesson and the lesson afterwards. Um, and also when you talk to them, you know, choose utterances or sentences that have 
uh, uh, irregular verbs or regular verbs in them so that they keep hearing them. Uh, display new words in the classroom. For example, you can have you know a, a, a list of other regular of, of many regular verbs that you can think your children can always want to use in class. Um, then there are those that are concerned with the immediate world. They love their family. They you know they they they, they want to hear about how others feel um, about their homes and so on. So you provide them familiar teaching materials, things that are from their environment. Let them talk about themselves, about friends, about the home. For example, if you want them to do an oral activity, let them talk about a friend, let them talk about uh, how they live at their home or the you know, family members. Um, then there are those that need constant praise. If they, you know, they, 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 they can be motivated by praise, what you can do is you make sure that when you give them activities to do, it is activities that they can do. Otherwise, if they cannot do it and they are not praised, they get demoralized. So make sure that they, 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 they are able to do what you give them so that you can praise them. Let them know you are pleased with their efforts. Uh, give them praise when doing something. And when you correct them, it should be very, very gently uh, because if you are harsh on them, they get demoralized, they get discouraged, then they don't want to learn anymore. Um, then we have uh, vowels and consonants. These are the uh, uh, um, sounds of the letters of the alphabet. Um, we have ones, uh, vowels, for example, they are sp speech sound. Um, we have five of them in the English language. However, we have also, you know, letters like Y and H that always produce, you know, vowel sounds. Um, they are classified as consonants, but they produce vowel sounds. Um, vowels are speech sound made by allowing breath to flow out of the mouth without closing any part of the mouth or throat. That means if you utter a, uh, for example, a. Uh, there is no way in your mouth where there is closure. The air is freely allowed to move out. Um, that is how we know that this is a vowel. If you don't know them by heart, that is how you can know this is a vowel and this is a consonant. Um, then consonants, um, all the other letters of the alphabet, like I said, excluding the H and the Y that have you know, uh, vowel sounds. Um, consonants are also speech sounds made by partially or completely blocking the flow of A through the mouth. For example, if we have P, 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 you are forcing the A out, but at the same time, you are blocking it to produce the sound. Um, then, um, I also want to talk about teaching English sounds by using a sound chart. This is an exercise that you can use in, in your class. It's very helpful for your children to learn the letters of the alphabet and the sounds that they produce because that is the foundation of writing, of reading, of speaking because all the sounds that we make are based on the letters of, of the alphabet. Um, although there are some with uh, um, a number of sounds that may not be you know, exactly the same. But once you start with that, your children will have a head start in you know, uh, reading and writing. Um, start teaching the English alphabet first. First of all, make sure that your children know the letters of the alphabet. Introduce a few sounds each week. After they've known the letters of the alphabet, then you can introduce a few sounds each week. 26 letters but 40 sounds in English. Uh, the knowledge of sounds enables them to read, write, speak, and, uh, uh, and speak properly, like I said before. Um, prepare flashcards for each letter, right? Hold it up and say the letter. This is how you, you teach them. You, you have a flashcard of, for example, the letter A, and you can hold it up for your children to pronounce it. Revise the letters until they can say the entire alphabet. 
then start teaching the sound for each letter after they've known the entire alphabet then you can start teaching the sound of each letter for each sound hold up the flashcard and say the sound tell the pupils to repeat the sound several times and then write the letter of the sound and repeat the sound again stand with your back to the children and form the letter of the sound in the a and you ask the children to make the same shape while saying the sound ask them to write the letter in the sand let them write several rows of the sound in their books go around help them to do this well and find pictures of objects that begin with the new sound for example the letter a you can have things like apples they begin with uh, the letter a and many others that you can bring uh, to class so that they just internalize that sound uh, and they can read it in uh, in in words uh, with you know pictures of those things that those words represent um, then we've got types of verbs uh, it's also important uh, apart from just knowing the definition of what a verb is it's very important to also appreciate the fact that there are different types of verbs that we use in everyday uh, uh, language um, they are first of all action verbs action verbs will state an action okay we all know what verbs are doing words but there are those words that do not express any action so there are those that express action like if i say run we can see you in motion running if you are speaking or if you laugh there is some act that you do and then there are some helping verbs helping verbs verbs are used to qualify the tense of ing forms of verbs for example running um, we can say he is running so you can see that that brings the uh, tense whereas if we say he was running we can know that was is bringing the past tense form of that sentence but if we use is then we know that the sentence is present continuous uh, other words that can be used uh, as helping verbs are are, am, uh, were. All right, then we have regular verbs. Regular verbs are all those verbs which take ed when they are changed into the past. For example, if we say kick, the past tense form of the word to kick or the verb to kick is kicked. So we have ed at the end. Okay, there are a lot of other words or other verbs that take ed when they are changed into the past and they are called regular verbs. Irregular verbs, however, are those ones that um, take different forms. They are transformed altogether. For example, if we use the verb to swim and we change it to the past, it becomes swim. If we say come, it becomes cam. All right? Write, wrote. So these are all verbs that do not, you know, add ed when they are changed to the past tense. They rather take or transform into different words. Then we have the big being verbs, the verb to be. All right? That is the verb to be. Uh, what do we mean by the verb to be? These do not express action. They are the main verb in the sentence, but they don't express action. For example, if we say, I am sick, the verb is am, and am is used to express the state of being sick. All right. The other uh, being or the verbs to be are is, are, way, am. Uh, the tenses. Um, tenses can be classified in terms of their function and form. Um, simple present tense is used to express things that are happening here and now, uh, general truth and so on, and they use the root of the verb. Then we have the simple past tense. Simple past tense uses the past tense form of the verb and is used to express things that happened in the past. Simple future tense 
uses will, shall, plus the root of the verb. Uh, for example, I will go home tomorrow. So it expresses things that will happen in the future. And future continuous tense is used to express things that will happen in the future, but they will be continuing at a certain point in time in the future. For example, I will be going home at that time. So that means that during that period, one would be in the process of going home. So that uses will or shall plus be plus the root form of the verb plus ing. Uh, then you've got the present perfect tense. Those things that happened in the past, but they still have significance for the present. Or they are still happening. Um, for example, he has been going to IOL or he has been uh, um, studying at IOL for the past three years. That means he started three years ago, but he's still continuing to study at IOL. Um, how is it formed? It's formed by using has or have uh, plus the past participle form of the verb. Um, past participle form of the verb would be, uh, you know, if you have, if, if you look at your table of the verbs, you've got the present tense, you have the past simple and the past participle is the third one. Um, so these are always used with structures like has, have, and so on. Um, then we've got uh, uh, um, um, teaching aids. The most common teaching aid, this you can find at every corner of the world, is the chalkboard. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, all those that have gone through formal schooling, mostly, uh, would attest to having, you know, been in a class where chalkboard was used. Uh, so it's an ancient old technology. Uh, but up to today, you cannot eliminate the chalkboard completely. It's still as, you know, applicable, it's still as relevant as before. Um, it is seen as the most popular and widely used. Um, although there are new developments in technology or in teaching technology, they cannot be sidelined. They are still used, they are still relevant, uh, but it is of tremendous value in all kinds of teaching. Convenient and effective visual aid, uh, it permits contrast, implies action and helps in note taking. For example, if you want to uh, uh, um, show contrast, you can use different colors on your chalkboard. Um, you can, you know, keep yourself, you can do something while you are teaching. So if there is a point that you want to raise, you want to record it, you can put it down so that your children can see that it's very important. You kind of isolate important uh, uh, parts of the lesson and put them down on the chalkboard. Um, as well as, you know, not taking. Can be used to enumerate items. If there are items that you want to list, you can list them. Sum up the important points of the lesson. You can have the main points of the lesson on the chalkboard so that the children know what to carry home with. Um, you can draw flow charts to illustrate for the class. You can supplement to other teaching aids. So even if you have a, a, a a PowerPoint, for example, you may still want to, you know, jot down some things on the chalkboard. Color chalk helps teaching and learning. Uh, neatness and orderly arrangement improves memory. So, if if you if you, if you order your information properly on the chalkboard or in an appealing manner, your children can always, you know, remember those things that you had written down. Salient points of the lesson put home through a piece of chalk and chalkboard. Uh, not used to full potential. Many people don't use the chalkboard to full potential. Uh, need, need to write neatly and clearly. But if you use it, it's better. You should not confuse the learners. They should be able to see what you write and make sure that your information is, uh, uh, you know, grouped accordingly. Because if you just mix up, uh, it will end up just confusing your learners. They will not be able to pick up information that they really need. Um, then we, we, we also, want, also want us to look at uh, um, approaches to teaching language. 
um, there is one approach that is called grammar or rules. If you teach language and you want to emphasize the rules, the grammatical rules, that is what we call rules approach to teaching language. When using rules uh, to teach grammar, teachers focus on grammar as a set of rules. So you are going to look at a grammatical aspect, introduce the rules for that grammatical aspect without using it in context and just hammer those rules and expect the children to reproduce them or to remember them and apply them. They have not seen them in an applied situation. Uh, they explain rules and forms and drill students on them. Uh, this leads to boredom because they are just there sitting and learning the rules. The children will be bored. Students produce the correct forms in tests and exercises but produce errors when using language in context. For example, um, if you say, um, for example, let's, let's, let's look at the, 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 the regular verb, kicked. You know, you, you, you change a verb by, you know, uh, adding the ed, you know. They will just know that if they see the way the verb kick, they will, and, and, and you have indicated past tense, they will, you know, indicate, uh, um, they, they will write kicked. But if they are come across a situation where uh, they should use the word kick in the past tense, they may resort to things like uh, he did kick. You know, they can still make mistakes because they have not seen, they have not practiced structures which use the verb kicked in context. For example, you did not bring them maybe a story that tells about the past, things that happened in the past, and the verb kicked is in there. Um, so that's the danger of using uh, the rules approach. Um, but then there is a preferred method that is called the communicative approach to teaching grammar. Teachers using communicative approach do not teach grammar at all. So they, they kind of, they, they, they don't teach rules. They believe children learn their first language without grammar instruction. For example, in our homes, we don't teach our toddlers uh, rules, but they just learn and they, you know, uh, uh, through practice, they learn the correct structures. So if they do that with the first language, then it's also, you know, a good idea to believe that they can also learn the second language in the same way. Students will absorb the rules as they hear, read, use language in communicative activities. So if they read about, they read uh, correct structures, correct grammar, they hear one, uh, the teacher using correct grammar, uh, their parents using correct gram grammar, then they will also adopt the same structures. Communicative model incorporates grammar teaching and learning into the larger context of teaching students to use the language. So instead of teaching the rules in isolation, these rules are incorporated in a text, for example, that the children use. Teachers using this model teach students the grammar they need to achieve defined communication tasks. For example, if uh, um, after using a certain uh, structure in a text or in context, then you can isolate that grammar and teach them that if you come across something like this, then you must know it is not a regular verb, so you don't add ed at the end. Uh, correcting people's mistakes for accuracy, there are times when we want them to be accurate and we don't require you know, so much you know, corrections. Of, or when you correct children, you should have a focus. Don't just correct everything that comes to mind. So if you are correcting them for accuracy, these are things to consider. Ask people to address the mistake him or herself. If they make a mistake, uh, you can ask them to address it. If they don't know, they are unable to, ask another child to give the correct answer and ask the first pupil to repeat the answer. If the other pupils do not know the correct answer, you should make the correction yourself as a teacher and ask the class and then individual pupils to repeat it, those that you asked earlier. When working in pairs or groups, encourage pupils to correct each other if they are unable to, then you uh, should do it. Uh, then you also need to look at 
correcting mistakes for fluency. Uh, if you just are interested in the flow of speech, it is advisable not to correct everything in what the child says. Allow them to finish. Allow children to speak and delay correction until later. So what you can do is just note the mistakes as you listen to the pupils speaking because if you just interrupt them every now and then to correct them, then you are not going to achieve fluency. Uh, do not interrupt while they are speaking. When you correct them first, ask them to give you the correct answer. If they are unable to give the correct answer, do so yourself and give them some practice on that uh, particular you know, uh, uh, aspect. If mistakes okay in grammar, spend some time in the next lesson revisiting or revising the point which all, uh, with all your pupils. Um, that is basically the end for uh, today's uh, presentation. I hope you get something out of it, but it's very important, like I said earlier, make sure you read these because these are just points that I've put together to, you know, on a PowerPoint, but uh, explanations for further understanding are in your study guides, so do not read these in isolation. Thank you very much.